We've been fighting a long time, and we have all lost so very much, so many loved ones gone. But you are not alone. There are pockets of resistance all around the planet. We are at the brink. You have no idea how important you are. If you're listening to this, you are the resistance. Ave Maricela Dei Mater Alma Ad Semper Virgo Felix Semper Welcome everybody, Steve with Sense Fidelity. Coming at you with another book, uh, the uh, book review, I guess you could say, but this one's a special one. The Tan Books is putting together. They have it as their 2023 book of the year. So we're recording this on January 24th. So it's the best book they ever, it's not the best book they ever had, but it's their book of the year for the year. So already a, I guess you could say a lot of buzz about it. It's Thomas Akempis's Meditation on Death that uh, Father Nixon, Robert Nixon down in Australia, the land done under, that was able to translate for the first time into English. So Father, Welcome again. Thank you for coming back on. Sorry I missed you when you were at Belmont, but uh, c- uh, congratulations on another translation. And uh, how you doing? I'm I'm doing very well, Steve. And congratulations to you on Veronica. Uh, it's a wonderful thing, wonderful blessing. Appreciate, it, appreciate. It. And if anybody doesn't understand what he's talking about, uh, is my third kid that uh, was born. When, when was she born again? Three, four months ago? Four months ago? I lost track of time. It feels like last week. Uh, so, <laughs> Meditations on Death by Thomas Akempis. Everyone and their brother has heard of, should have, or at least should have heard of the Imitation of Christ. Yeah. Or at least read so, it. So, this, this is an amazing book by Thomas Akempis, who, of course, is best known for the Imitation of Christ. But what a lot of people don't realize is he actually wrote... Um, a tremendous amount of different stuff in all different uh, genres a lot of it spiritual writing he wrote also a life sort of a few saints and um, sermons and instructions to novices um, this particular work his meditations on death is one of his most striking works um, one of the things which he recommends to us in the imitation of christ is that meditating on death is a useful spiritual practice uh-huh. that it's one of the most powerful ways of turning our hearts and our minds towards the things of eternity and conquering any temptations in this passing world as well as equipping us with courage uh, to to take whatever difficulties we might confront now i found this um, remarkable work um, in a very early edition of the complete works of Thomas Akempis, an edition published back in 1523. And, um, you know, it's uh, it's a book which, when I first read it, really struck me. You know, I thought this is really hearing the, the content of what he's talking about when he recommends meditating on death, because he just recommends it in the imitation of Christ. He doesn't tell us how to do that, but this book, uh, fills in the gaps and leads the reader through this very dramatic and moving meditation on death. And it's the kind of book which, um, once you read, I believe it will change your life and perspective forever. Yeah, obviously, it gets in the, he gets he goes through the four last things, and uh, I, I was shot. I don't guess I was shot. Heaven is only like two or three pages, but he really digs deep into hell, and there was that part of. You always heard about, well, I don't know if everyone, everyone's always heard it, but you always hear about the extreme cold and extreme heat. And he was the first yeah. time I read that he compares it to the chills of a fever. That's right. It's, it's a very dramatic description of what it's like. And, you know, um, perhaps uh, uh, we might have heard before about that, yeah, in heat, in, in hell, there's this extremity of heat, which, of course, is the conventional image. But then also the extremity of cold and he talks about how these two can coexist and as you mentioned he says it's a bit like experiencing that kind of terrible fever where you're sweating and overcome by heat but at the same time a kind of 
chilly and shivering at the same time. And he, he talks about that. He says, um, consider next the extremities of the pains which are suffered there. These far exceed any pains which our bodies or hearts can experience during this mortal life. For the fire which burns so ceaselessly there is incomparably hotter than any flame found the heat of earthly fire to the same extent that our earthly fire is hotter than a mere painted picture of fire. Next, consider the freezing cold which prevails in hell. You might wonder how this coldness can possibly be possible given the omnipotence, omnipresence of the searing flames. But the dire chill of hell is paradoxically felt at the very same time as its scorching fire. It is true that the pain and discomfort caused by this malevolical combination of burning heat and bitter cold cannot be imagined by the mortal mind. Perhaps the closest approximation to be found in our earthly realm is the ghastly feeling of those afflicted with virulent and noxious fevers who experience an overwhelming heat and a chilling frigidity at the sleep while shivering violently. So, uh, actual terrifying thing to think about there and when I reflect on my own experience of life, I don't think I've ever actually had a fever which is quite like that, but I, I can kind of imagine what it's like and it must be a, a terribly um, nauseating thing to experience and what's more to experience it permanently to experience it uh, forever without respite so uh, yes indeed very frightening yeah you always like i said i've heard that before about the extreme cold extreme heat i'm going my memory my imagination i'm thinking okay extreme fire and then you're going to antarctica to an exponential level but that that exp explanation that a campus did with the uh, chills and a fever going, you know, that makes total, I, I immediately go, that makes total sense. That is torturous. You can't get warm. You can't get cold. And you're shivering like uncontrollably. Uh, that would be terrible. That would be torturous for obviously for uh, eternity. It, it, it would be very much so. And, you know, when Thomas Akempis was writing this, um, he was possibly drawing on his own personal experience of that feeling. Because in the 15th century, you know, health conditions were, were, were not good. There were a lot of plagues and fevers and so forth, which were a regular part of, of the life which people live. Yeah, and that's something that everyone can experience. Uh, most people have had a fever. Most people have had chills. So you can, you can, you can think about that. Yeah. Not everyone's gone to uh, the North Pole or the South, uh, you know, and all the way to Antarctica or anywhere where it's bone chillingly cold or even in the states, Green Bay, Wisconsin, it was really. I have a friend of mine that did a, a little bucket thing and threw the bucket up and it froze. Uh, I've never been in that kind of cold. Yeah. I, that, I can't experience it. What you've been through a fever. Um, indeed, I, indeed. I thought it's just. Indeed, uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I, I was saying uh, at our monastery here at New North here at the moment. It's around about. Uh, 110 degrees most days. So this uh, certainly gives us an insight into the extremity of heat. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. I'm in the south, so when it gets summer my, in our neck of the woods, yeah, we. I remember playing baseball in 100-degree heat. And uh, my, you can ask my brother. He caught those games. It was in a it was in like a little wow. valley. There was no air going through, and it was just hot. And you're just blazing. You know, and you think about the dugouts and the – and underneath the stadium, underneath it was the uh, locker room. There was no air conditioning back in the early 1900s. Right, so that right. thing got hot. And I couldn't, yeah, you can imagine being that uncomf uncomfortable hot. And that's just, what, a not even 1% of what the experience of hell would be. Yeah, it is the absolute extremity. Um, the extremity that our nerves and our experience could be pushed to. His uh, judgment uh, chapter... I know people have always thought about it, but I mean, he just writes the whole thing of my friend is wise to call to mind his final judgment very frequently. Whenever you have to decide upon a course of action, reflect for a moment upon how you will account for it on that last day. Will yeah. it cause you to be ashamed? I, 
or feel regret? A very, very sobering thought, uh, isn't it? Because we, we're confronted with so many uh, moral decisions every single day of our life. And some of them are, are big, obvious ones, some of them are small ones. But to think uh, for each of our actions, how would I be uh, accounting for this before that final tribunal of judgment? Because everything we do has an eternal consequence. So if it's a, it's a temptation or if it's a possibility to do some act of good and we, we decline it, we, we uh, omit that particular opportunity for doing good. And it's also an encouragement to do those acts of good because we know um, that when we confront that final tribunal and uh, Christ will say, I was hungry and you gave me to eat, I was thirsty and gave me to drink and so forth. So it puts any a perspective of eternal consequence on each one of our actions in this life, which I think is the surest possible moral compass we can have for making the right decision in all of those situations. But to get to that tribunal, you have to die. Well, you do. And this is the thing about it, that um, death, even for a person who is completely righteous, he points out that it is, in fact, a quite terrifying experience because for everyone, for the saint and the sinner alike, it's this stepping out into the utterly unknown. And when we, we do that, when our body, when our soul departs from our mortal body, um, we are going to be confronted by, uh, by these horrors according to tradition, medieval tradition and so forth. Um, when our soul leaves the body, there are demons there waiting to seize upon it. And this is even if we're completely blameless and innocent in this world. Um, so there are, there are spiritual forces that make this journey uh, across the kind of um, metaphoric river Styx something greatly to be dreaded. And he talks about this. He says... Um, Think also about the fate of your earthly body, this lump of clay out of which uh, has been formed by the hand of God. For indeed, it shall rot and decay and grow black and putrid, withering away to nothing and eventually crumbling to dust. And at the point of death, a multitude of demons will appear before you, ready to seize upon each departed soul. With gaping jaws and grasping hands, these shall be like roaring lions seeking whom they may devour. Next, consider how the condemned soul must pass through a region entirely unknown to it, where a multitude of cruel and vicious demons shall viciously await it. Instead, consider the, the condemned soul will find itself in an un, immense cavern of utter and impenetrable darkness, fetid and heavy with all the charnel odors of the grave. And the various evil spirits of each of the vices shall seek it out to torment it. So very uh, powerful stuff there. Really, uh, almost almost the stuff of of nightmares. And it, it's a reminder that at the moment of death, you know, we pray for the moment uh, of our death. We pray in the Hail Mary for Our Lady to be with us at this hour. And according to tradition, Saint Michael, the Archangel, is there for each and every soul that leaves the body to guide it safely to this tribunal of judgment. So the experience of, of death, departure from the body, in itself is something greatly uh, to be treated with, with awe. And you read the lives of the saints, they're always terrified about the their approaching death. Or I haven't read one when they said they're, they they are sure they know that they're going there. They're cool, calm, and confident. They're all terrified. They don't know what's going to happen. But you see, my like modern guys, everyone goes, "Oh, he died peacefully." Like, man, all how come all these other these Hall of Famers that we have were terrified in those last minutes? Not to the point of despair, but they were always thinking that they were the worst. They were, you know, how is guys going to judge me? Even though they were holier beyond holy, they still weren't, you know like pompous in the sense of I'm going to heaven. I'm going straight there, bypassing everything. Um, it's going to be an easy road. road. Uh, it's a little bit different from Thomas Aquinas to a modern mindset. Oh, yes. 
And, and what's more, you know, as you mentioned, Steve, we often are inclined in this modern world to imagine uh, death as just like a gentle falling asleep and so forth. But uh, if we think about the physical reality of it for a lot of people, I mean, I guess for some people it is just that gentle falling asleep, but a lot of people are, are in the throngs of physical decline and uh, loss of control over their mental faculties, and that combined with the actual pain and suffering. Um, he says, O mortal, reflect carefully upon that unknown time when you will come to your final hour and when the lethal hand of death will fall upon your shoulder and when you will be compelled to cross that dark stream from which none have ever returned. So I think it is something which we're quite right to be a little frightened of. And um, it says in the book of uh, Ecclesiasticus that ultimately the fear of death is the source of all human fear. And I think there is a degree of truth in it. Yeah, I always think it was, I think it was St. Cyprian that talked about having a, uh, a like a sword hanging by a, a thread over your head and the thought of it. Yeah. Always constantly, mm -hmm. you look up and there's that, it could come down on you at any time. It, it, it could come, yes. This, this sense of certainty and that might be something that we want to um, blot out of our minds, but in reality, it is an omnipresent thing. And that's one of the things which we find in the rule of St. Benedict. He counsels us to keep death always daily before our eyes. And a lot of people have, have probably encountered that spiritual advice before, but wonder, how can I do that? And certainly reading this book is uh, enough food for meditation to be able to do that, to meditate upon the um, imminence, the uncertainty of death uh, very vividly and very powerful. We'll give some people some joy instead of talking about the death and the hell and all that. Heaven, he writes, and again, it was the shortest chapter, but yeah. the beauty that he writes of it, he didn't need that many words. I mean, it re reminded me of like, yeah. uh, I would say the, if you wanted to earthly, the Emerald yeah. City. It is. It is a, a very beautiful description of heaven. And um, most people uh, and various people have written to describe the afterlife. And they find that heaven somehow is um, the most difficult to write about. Um, that obviously it transcends words and transcends um, the images which we can give. He write, does write about the joys of heaven, though, wonderfully here. And at the very end of the book, there are also um, some poetry which he wrote. It's not well known that Thomas Kempis also wrote poetry, but some of his spiritual canticles to heaven. And he talks about this. Um, he says, the true joys of heaven are necessarily beyond our present comprehension and surpass our thoughts, sensations, words, and desires. Nevertheless, it is both helpful and possible to try to imagine them according to our limited mortal capacity. For this provides a very powerful and efficacious encouragement for the cultivation of virtue and the resistance of the temptations to sin. In meditating upon the joys of heaven, the authentic visions and similitudes which can be found amongst the writings of the saints provide a wonderful and delightful source of information. Heaven can be likened to a great city miraculously constructed from the purest gold and the most precious gemstones. Each of its gates is miraculously fashioned from a single immense pearl. And that glorious gleaming metropolis shall be adorned and surrounded by verdant and gorgeous fields, filled with multicolored flowers of incomparable and entrancing beauty. And in that city, the tranquil warmth and gentle light of spring shall prevail eternally and the air will be suffused with fragrant perfume, offering ever new and intoxicating delight. And the vividness of its reality shall surpass that of this present life, just as that of our current waking reality surpasses in vividness and intensity the visions of a dream. I think that last element of the description is, is truly wonderful. Um, and 
you might remember that he said when he was talking about the fires of hell, that these surpass in intensity our earthly fire, just as much as an earthly fire surpasses a painting of a fire. Now, the idea that the reality and vividness of our experience in heaven is going to transcend the reality and vividness of this world just as much as a waking state surpasses a sleeping state or a dreaming state, which I think is, is, is very powerful indeed. You know, to think that what we're experiencing now isn't full reality. It's really a, a, only like a dream state, a partial reality, and we encounter this fullness of reality, this fullness of life and love only in the kingdom of heaven. When you were reading that, it made me think of uh, going back to hell, of, of uh, the, the senses being attacked in hell, because you mentioned about the, what he mentions about the intoxicating uh, fragrance in heaven was the opposite, yeah. is the complete opposite in hell, whereas where I think it mentions in there talking about the uh, the smell so bad that you're, you'll try not to breathe, and but you have to breathe. And then you're doing both of the same thing. You pass, or try not to pass yeah. out and breathe. And, uh, th you, yeah, you're, you're struggling with this choice between suffocating or breathing in yeah. this uh, horrible channel smell. And yes, but he does contrast this with the sensory state of heaven, where each of the senses is uh, fulfilled with the greatest possible joy and delight. And perhaps when we normally imagine heaven, we don't think about the senses so much because we think, well, the senses are physical and they end when we leave our body. Uh, to a degree, that's true. But on another level, our, our senses, um, even on Earth, do in fact um, give us some insight into the reality of the ultimate goodness of God even though it's in a very imperfect and mediated way. So, um, you know, as, as Catholics, we believe in the resurrection, the final resurrection of the body. So the idea of experiencing sensory delights in heaven isn't something which would, uh, which should, you know, surprise us too much. So he's, so he leads off part one with the, the four last things. Part two, is a discourse in the person of a sinner about to die. Oh, yes. Yeah. What is, what is that this? Is, this, I think, is one of the most creative parts of the book, one of the most striking uh, parts. And um, in this situation, he begins by saying, okay, um, are you feeling a bit lukewarm in your faith? Are you feeling temptations? Are you feeling discouraged and so forth? And he recommends a remedy. And the remedy he recommends is go into your room and uh, lie down on your bed and imagine that you are confronting your end, your, your final death, that it is in fact your deathbed. And then he says, imagine what you will think and feel at that time. And then he proposes uh, or gives us this imaginary discourse in the person of a sinner who is about to die and all the thoughts and regrets and anxieties which will be going through their mind at that time. And I think this is a very um, powerful way of writing. And when he says the person of a sinner going through death, we never get really details of what these sins are, so we don't really know just how bad this person was. Certainly when we get to the end, we see this encouraging others to uh, amend their life, to do penance. But but I, I really think that this speaks so powerfully. And um, he says to us there, he talks about um, the uncertainty of death. This is in the person of the, uh, the sinner who is confronting his final end. Alas, the pains of death now surround me. Streams of iniquity flow all around me, and the snares of death have trapped me. O oh, death, how bitter is the thought of you to the sinful person, yet infinitely more bitter than this thought is your presence. Late was I to come to real belief and repentance for my sinful life, yet how rapidly I succumb to my demise, 
and how quickly the stream of my life flows away. O oh, death, my final foe and last companion, you have sprung upon me suddenly, you have seized me in your chilling and inescapable grasp, like a lion waiting in ambush. With your unbreakable ropes you have bound me, and with chains of constricting iron you drag me after you, just as a condemned criminal is dragged off to the gallows. I clasp my hands together and groan from the depths of my heart, longing in vain to flee from this fatal mortality which has overtaken me. But there is no place of refuge for me and no stronghold to which I escape. I turn my eyes in every direction, to every place that surrounds me, to the earth's furthermost end, and yet there is no one who can help me now. And I hear the grim voice of death calling to me, sinister, thunderous, and with a hollow spectral resonance. And drawing ever more nigh, it says, you are mine now. Neither your wealth, nor your honours, nor your reason, nor your knowledge, nor your wisdom, nor friends, nor your kin are able to free you from my clutches. Arise and let us depart now from the land of living. For the number of your years and days has been eternally predetermined by God, and these have reached the appointed end. So the idea of death coming as this unwelcome guest, as this final companion, and uh, I think it's a very sobering thought. And he invokes very much death as the image of the Grim Reaper, which was a, a, a popular image in the imagination of, of people at the time when he was writing. And that's, uh, I can put it up on the show it, that's the image you got. At the beginning of it, the Grim yeah. Reaper horse. Yes, it is. It's, it's a, it's, it is a striking image and a very frightening one, you know. And uh, I was so pleased when Tan chose that image for this part in the book because, um, you know, I, I hadn't really given it too much thought, but I, I realized this was the, the perfect uh, image of that reality. You know, this, um, this kind of grim horseman uh, bearing a sickle in his hand it might seem a little bit melodramatic, but, um, you know, I, I really think that when we face that final moment, just about anything we can imagine is, is not going to be melodramatic over, and over the top because it's probably going to be, um, you know, worse. We, I, I mean, if we've ever been very sick or severely injured or in great pain, we realize that, you know, this is, is no laughing matter. And then, if death is going to be the extremity of that, it is certainly in itself is an event which is which is very sobering. And it's not just depressing, but on the contrary, it can give us the strength to fight this battle for the virtues, to serve God faithfully, knowing that um, by doing this, we are going to have to pass through this difficult step. But what lies beyond this step is going to be magnificent. And glorious and eternal. Yeah, Alphonsus writes, I got it up on the my wall up there. It's one of my first ones from Preparation for Death, uh, Ecclesiastes 740. If um, in all your works know thy end, and you'll never sin. <clears throat> and uh, we don't think about that because you got one chance to die right. We don't get a, a redo, we got one chance of getting this done right. <laughs> well, well, we do, we do. And when you say uh, die right, um, that includes living right, and um, St. Robert Bellarmine uh, says the surest way of ensuring a good death is by living a good life. Yeah. I think there's such a, a, a wonderful truth in that, that every, not only our final moments come only once, but also every day, if we think about it, comes only once and is never going to return to us. So... Uh, each day is is an opportunity for working towards this glorious end to which we aspire. So it sounds like you're uh, segueing into the next one was the uh, lament over time wasted. Indeed. And, you know, this is a very practical and down-to-earth thing, which perhaps not many of us think about. Um, you know, that how finite our time is here on earth and how it's not going to come back, you know, and uh, 
you know, way you, you we think about our, our life here, it's like you've got, you're given a certain sum of money uh, at the beginning, but you don't know exactly how much money that might be, whether it's, you know, $100 or $1,000 or a million dollars. And, you know, you spend it each day, of course, because you, you have to. Um, but, you know, you don't want to waste it. You need to make the best of it because it's unknown and also because it's limited. So as you mentioned, you know, we only have one chance at this at this life. And um, he's, he writes here, this is the person who is about to die. And then as I lay there in the throes of death and fully aware that I had but a few moments left, I reflected upon the time I had wasted during my life. How greatly was this wasted time to be lamented and regretted. These days which I permitted to slip away in vain. How foolishly and profitlessly did I let my life pass by, wasting it neglectfully and carelessly, as if it were a thing of no value whatsoever, or as if it were endless in scope and would never run out. I squandered my time like an irresponsible spendthrift, squanders money, not considering for a moment that it was both precious and limited. Alas, what benefit has all my pride and brain glory brought me? At this moment of my mortal dissolution, what profit have I gained from all my avaricious and insatiable striving after riches and pleasure? For these have all vanished, like an insubstantial shadow passing in the night, or like a courier or herald who runs swiftly by without pausing to linger, or like a ship hastening through the waves which leaves no trace of its passing or like a bird flying through the air, which is quickly gone and leaves no footprint of its flight, or like the sound of a bell ringing out, which once it has ceased to toll, leaves no lasting impression, <coughs> or like an arrow which cuts through the air. Once it has gone, the air through which it has passed immediately closes in upon itself, and not a trace of it ever having been remains. I think... Uh, that last part, of course, was a paraphrase of a section from the Book of Wisdom. But the idea of the transitory nature of all things, that we will be gone from this world, and uh, in the end, as far as the world is concerned, after you know a few years or however long, depending upon who we are, we will, um, you know, we will all we'll, we'll have forgotten the journey. The story will be over for us, but for our immortal soul, it's only the beginning. And so this life is the testing ground. It's not a time you want to waste. But think about it. It's a little bit like if you were doing a, an important exam and you've got a limited period of time to uh, pass this exam, to do well on it. And are you going to waste that time as it's ticking away? So. It's a wonderful reminder, I think, of the importance of seizing the day uh, in a Christian sense of trying to make our lives conform most closely to the sanctity to which God is calling us. I was just thinking of uh, the great philosopher Darius Rucker of uh, Hootie and the Blowfish from my old country of South Carolina. Uh, the song Time, uh, one, of the, one of the verses is... Uh, uh, time without courage, time without fear is just wasted, wasted time. Yeah. Yeah, very striking. And that's true. And I think probably most of us, you know, sometimes have the experience, I certainly do, of thinking, you know, I've, I've wasted a lot of valuable time, you know. I mean, of course, we have to, some oh, time I... is legitimately spent in recreation, in, in doing nothing because we need rest or whatever. But Twitter, then you can look back. Social media. Looking oh, at stupid videos yeah. on YouTube, you know, whatever. In, in, indeed, and I mean, people spend uh, spend hours on it, don't they? Um, you know, as a monk, in a way, I'm I'm kind of blessed that it's not such a big part of my life as perhaps it is for people in the world. But still, you know, it is it is something which we deal with, and we use these technologies to a limited extent. Um, so yeah, to think, you know, time can be wasted so easily. You know, you can look something up on Google and then end up looking up a whole series of things and, you know, and, and waste much more time than you really need. So to think about it, it's all precious, you know, um, that, and it's irreplaceable too. 
I think the philosopher Seneca says that time is the one thing which we can never be given back. Mm -hmm. But it's the one thing which people show least concern about uh, stealing from others or wasting ourselves. So, uh, yeah, to, to value it as a precious commodity. The uncertainty of a last minute repentance and conversion. You know, a lot of people almost bank on that. Yeah. How's, what's Thomas um, and, and, and he makes a very good point here about the theology uh, or, or the, the possibility of last minute repentance. And of course, we know that sometimes last minute repentance can be effective. We need to think only about the good thief, Dismas, uh, who was promised paradise. But on the other hand, he points out that um, when we're about to die, it's actually not the ideal time to be going about making repentance because often in death, um, people's physical and mental and even spiritual faculties are weakened. So that they're not actually at their best when they're at that situation of pain and anxiety. Um, Furthermore, he points out that if you repent from something only when it's too late for you to do it, then how can you tell if that repentance is really sincere? Because you don't have the opportunity of living for longer and showing that you really are going to carry out your resolution, your, your, your penitence. And of course, you've got no opportunity for carrying out works of, of penance uh, and so forth. So he says that even the person concerned can't be sure of just how uh, sincere their repentance is. And, you know, if you think about the last minute repentance, it's a little bit like the repentance of a person who gets caught committing some crime. And of course, once they get caught, they're repentant. But, you know, is that really genuine? Because um, if they weren't caught, would they, you know, so as you can see, and he writes about this, um, he says, uh, in contrast, the passing of those who leave their attention to ensuring their salvation until their last days is always a wretched experience, dominated by anxiety and uncertainty. For they find themselves longing for an 11th hour repentance. But who knows whether such penitence is really sincere or effective or not? For even the person who is dying cannot really tell whether they are genuinely sorry for their sin, or if they simply fear the fires of hell which otherwise awake them. And who can possibly evaluate whether their contrition of heart is genuine or sufficient when it is not and cannot be accompanied by any corresponding and commensurate deed. For just as faith without works is dead, so are words and intentions which are unsupported by action. O oh, tomorrow, tomorrow, false and lying tomorrow, you have deceived me and I have allowed myself to be deceived. For by depending upon you, O oh, elusive and illusionary tomorrow, I have permitted myself to be engulfed in the abyss of death. For you have abandoned me and fled from me. Yes, to me there will be no more tomorrow. So, very dramatic words. And a timely reminder that uh, 11th hour repentance, well, it's possible. And of course, God's mercy is infinite. And some people do repent very sincerely. But it's an inherently uncertain thing. And what's more, as he points out, even if it wasn't uncertain, would you want to make your last moments, moments, moments of regret and penitence? You know, I think not. So it's a reminder to uh, have our lives in order, you know, to, to ask ourselves every day, are we ready to confront the end? To ask ourselves every night, if I don't make it through this night, am I ready for what follows? Now, like I was uh, last paragraph, uh, my friends, listen to me now carefully. I implore you, know that at this moment, I would rejoice more for one of you to say a single Hail Mary for the salvation of my poor soul than I would to receive an infinite treasure of gold and silver 
would be granted sovereignty over all the kingdoms of earth. As, as uh, Pierre Giorgio Frassati has that line, he goes, say one Hail Mary for me and I'll be eternally grateful. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, and that's a, that's a beautiful thought and, 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 you know, very powerfully puts it into perspective, doesn't it? That all the gold and silver, all the sovereignty of the earth, in the end, they're not going to be all that important because we can't take any of them with us that they're going to seem just like the least important things we have to worry about. And that one Hail Mary, that one um, uh, calling out for the mercy of God through the intercession of the Blessed Mother of God, that one augmentation of grace is what is really going to be critical to us at that last moment, much more so than anything which we could possibly pursue in this life. And we think in this life, while we're healthy and everything's going well, we might think, you know, put all of our efforts into into these things, which in the end are going to be just taken away, just going to vanish like dreams. And it's it's the uh, Hail Mary. And we can say, I mean, you know, we say Hail Marys for, for our deceased beloved, for souls in purgatory and, and so forth. So I think it's a reminder of the power of this, single prayer because it's a prayer which which god which christ loves to hear because it's um it's giving honor to his blessed mother and you know if we think about if we hear our own uh mother uh being praised or having kindness or love exhibited to her then it's such a, a wonderful thing and um i think jesus is just the same whenever we call out to his mother he he will listen without fail and i mentioned before that we can, sorry that we say hail mary's and rosaries for the departed i think we can also say them for ourselves mm -hmm. in advance you know um, I, i'm not well i mean you can of course get indulgences and so forth but to think well you know uh, to pray for our own to, to put this on the side of credit in our favor while we have the opportunity by showing sincere uh, honor and love for the blessed queen of heaven i remember that the i can't remember what saint story it is but it's talking about the the judgment and a guy standing in front of the judge and uh, our lord and the scale is getting lower and lower all the sins getting piling on and our lady comes up with one rosary and just dumps it on the scale and tips it to the side of in favor of him and uh it just goes back yeah. to the power of that just going all, all the stuff you could do and his one prayer was able to take him take him away from the graphs of hell i guess we don't yes, think about indeed it. yeah yeah because the grace and the the power of these prayers and of the sacraments and everything um are are much infinitely greater than what we can possibly imagine and to think about this single hail mary being valued at all uh, more than all the gold and silver in the world and think what a great treasure we have uh, in the prayer of the rosary how we can uh, enrich the scales as you as you put it uh, with this wonderful force of grace and this is not only for ourselves but also for um for other departed, for departed souls. So, yes. So, even uh, even the three Hail Marys. There's stories about just saying the three Hail Marys helps so, helps in salvation. So you don't have to, if you can't do the whole 15 minutes, just get three, so, which is, I think, a friend of mine did it uh, one, like 50 seconds or 68 seconds or something like that. It's, it goes back to time. Where's your time valuable or not? We're just waiting for things to happen or whatever. And that we, in fact, can use this time uh, profitably by by saying prayers, you know, to, to uh, say even if it's only three Hail Marys, this all does some good. And it, it also not only does good in terms of obtaining graces and mercies for us, but helps us to do the right thing in life, to make the right moral decisions, to be able to confront difficulties with courage and fortitude. Um, and also to show compassion and mercy whenever we have the opportunity of doing this. So in, in praying to the Blessed Virgin, we're reminded 
of her love and goodness. And this in itself is a lesson um, to, to try to imitate that wonderful and perfect goodness which she embodied. The uh, chapter on the unreliability of human assistance in the hour of death reminded me of one of the Desert Father sayings of, in a time of prosperity, your friends are endless, but when, it, when, the, when the tough gets going, you can't find any. Yeah, indeed, indeed. And um, this is, is a very striking chapter. So he talks about how, you know, his kind of apparent friends and everyone are, are all around him telling him he's got nothing to worry about. He says, oh, how deceitful are the crowds of so-called friends which congregate around the dying, and how deceptive are the honeyed words of physicians, for they all promised good things to me and all confidently assured me of my recovery. There is absolutely nothing to fear. They told me you are in no peril at all. No need to rush to make your confession to a priest. This malady is nothing but a temporary ailment and a minor vexation of the nerves. Simply rest and take things easy and put all anxiety from your mind, for this infirmity will soon pass. O oh, my false friend, or rather true enemy, by following your guidance and counsel and not admitting the reality of my impending death, I was defrauded of the opportunity of timely repentance and reconciliation. How I regret paying heed to your consoling but misleading assurance. It was not long ago that I looked upon my own body and saw it full of life and strength and a bloom with the flower of youth. But now I behold it dry and desiccated, its former glory gone like the flower of the field, which springs up in the morning and withers by the end of day. And now the hour of my final dissolution approaches and my mortal life draws to its termination. My vision fails, my skin grows pale, my hair is grey, life ebbs away. My spirits leave me, my hopes deceive me. This day's my last, my time has passed. So a uh, very, very striking thing. And, um, you know, when uh, th this is a, a theme which we encounter quite a lot in late medieval literature, that when you confront death, um, all your friends and relatives are just going to abandon you and you know, the physicians can't really be trusted because they don't know what they're doing or they just want their fees and so forth. It probably doesn't strike us quite so as being quite so realistically as it was to the late medieval imagination. But nevertheless, I think uh, for a lot of people, there is an element of, of uh, realism in it. Yeah, it's almost like... Uh... You, you should understand that the other people probably don't care as much as you do because it's your body, your soul, well, your death coming. You care about that well, a little bit more than the other guys do. Absolutely. And even the most caring doctor in the world, I'm sure, is, is still caring quite as much as, as what you are. And, um, of course, uh, you know, relatives and friends can be a tremendous support. But often the experience of death is, is actually a stressful thing upon those family relationships and so forth. And we need only think about after the death of, of a loved one, how often bitterness in families arise about their final treatment or about their will and so forth. So um, yes, so that we can't rely upon anyone else to help us in this situation. Above all, it's an experience which we're going to have to face completely alone one way or the other when i say alone i don't mean without uh, our spiritual helpers the blessed virgin mary saint joseph the patron saint of the dying saint michael and so forth of course these are powerful helpers but as far as our purely human companions we have to pass through that dark door into the unknown by ourselves We've got no one to hold our hands as we as we make that uh, immense and unimaginable final journey. Is that why you hear people say that? Uh, I think Stephen Saints have said that that going to bed is like practice for it because you're laying down in your so-called coffin, closing your eyes. You have no idea if you're going to wake up in that morning. It's kind of like Augustine saying, "You're not promised tomorrow." Why would you say, you know, hey, you know what? I'll put that off for tomorrow. I'm going to go to confession later. 
we ain't promised the next day, much less than the next minute. Uh, it's like mm-hmm. bed when you lay you down to sleep. You, my, you pray to God, my soul to keep. <laughs> yeah. Um, yes, indeed. And this is at the heart of the Benedictine wisdom to, uh, to try to make peace with anyone uh, within our community before the end of the day. And I think that applies to everyone, you know, to, to look, well, think at the end of the day, when I'm going to sleep, what is it that is troubling me, which is causing me anxiety or pain? And of course, we can't fix all of those things ourselves, but, you know, to do what we can towards uh, peace and reconciliation. And to say, you know, when we see each person each day and then say goodbye to them, I think this might be my final goodbye to this person. And what is the, um, the relationship with them, which I want to, to make this final goodbye. If there's any kind of bitterness or misunderstanding, it's, you know, it's, it's such a, a wonderful thing if it can be, uh, can be resolved before the end of the day, because, you know, it might be your very last chance. And particularly if it's a person you love, you know, to, to show that your love, your love for them uh, in, a, in a genuine way, because it might be the last time you ever see them. Yeah, it's that line of, was it, now I lay me down to sleep, pray to Lord my soul to keep. If I die before I wake, pray to Lord my soul to take. My soul to take, indeed. And that's a, that's a wonderful prayer, I think, you know, because it, it really says it all, doesn't it? Um, you know, that, that if we die, and this is a real possibility um, for everyone, I mean, for, probably depending upon your age and state of health and so forth, but to be conscious that we're not guaranteed Tomorrow, we're not guaranteed uh, dawn, except for the eternal dawn, which is a dawn onto um, what's completely unknown. Hopefully, a dawn onto the glories of eternal day. But to ask, commit our soul at this moment. You know, and I, I think God, in his mercy, um, hears these kinds of prayers, and they do make a real difference. So the last one is the final exhortation. Oh, yes. about this. this is a, a beautiful exhortation. So this is when he is confronting his end and he's kind of making a final farewell to his friends and also encouraging them. Um, and it is, uh, I think, very elucidating. I mentioned before that although it's presented as in the person of a sinner, my kind of imagination is that this person is actually not really such a bad sinner at all because of the way he encourages his friends. It speaks with a true sanctity and wisdom. And he says, um, I realize that whatever state my conscience is in when I leave this world, in the same state it will accompany me when I appear before the divine tribunal of judgment. My own conscience, exposed to the view of all, will serve there as the principal evidence and witness, either for me or against me. And this, in turn, will determine my everlasting destiny. Blessed, indeed, are those who keep this moment of death before their eyes of their mind, every moment of their life. For they shall die. That is, safe entrance into the kingdom of heaven they will arrive at this point in security peace and tranquility and indeed even with joy and relief but as for me i know full well that this night is to be my last by tomorrow morning i ask you where do you think my poor spirit will be dwelling and in what realm shall fields of eternal light and ineffable beauty accompanied by the glorious hosts of angels and the wondrous communion of saints or will it rather be groaning in the infernal abyss of nameless darkness, where the fire is never extinguished and the worm does not cease to gnaw, tormented by hideous demons, the grim spectres of the wretched dead? As I look around me, my own, and yet I seem to behold the spiritual reality of the world beyond this one. And there are swarms of demons hovering over my body, eagerly waiting to seize my soul. Goodbye, my friends, and the inexorable throne of God's judgment, 
to return an account of all my thoughts, actions, and words. May your kind prayers help my soul to obtain mercy. Blessed Virgin Mary, and the radiant choir of angels, and the glorious communion of saints, all supplicate and plead for my salvation. Though I am entirely unworthy of their advocacy, for God knows how very much I am in need of it. As for yourselves, I urge you with the utmost love in the Lord, while you still have the time and opportunity. For in God alone is our hope, our salvation, and our eternal life. Let us earnestly pray for each other, so that we may all find peace, pardon, and everlasting happiness with him who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. So that's the conclusion of his exhortation, and I think finishes on a very uh, positive and, and encouraging note, a sober note, yet nevertheless one which tells us we've still got the gift of time, we all still have the chance, the decision hasn't been made, and so to seize the day to make the best of this wonderful opportunity which God has given us during this earthly life. So again, that's the uh, book that's really being pushed. Tan has put out. Again, uh, Father Nixon uh, translated it. Meditation on Death by Thomas Akempis. Uh, check it out underneath the show notes. You'll see the link. Below this, there's a thing called Show More. You click that button. Boom, this thing drops down. You'll see the link right up on top. Uh, get a copy of it. Uh, get the invitation to go with it if you haven't done that. Uh Obviously, anything that Thomas Akempis wrote is is just fantastic, and it's thank you, Father Nixon, for coming out and uh, translating and finding it and thinking, you know, this is a good idea. They actually put together in English, so for the first time ever, it's available for people in the English speaking world. It is, it is, it is, and I I think it's fairly safe to say that there's no other book which is quite like it. So thank you so much, Steve, for uh, this wonderful opportunity to share with your listeners today and um, please be assur assured of my my prayers and my blessings with you all well, if, if you didn't if you didn't record if you didn't uh, translate it there would not be a video of us talking about it so the thanks is the thank you is all on this side of the table here. so uh now I appreciate it and yeah you're very welcome and uh, uh before we go can you give everybody a, a final blessing for everybody? Yes, through the intercession of the Blessed Virgin Mary and our Holy Father, St. Benedict, may the blessing of Almighty God come down upon you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and remain with you always. Amen. Father, thank you again.